So welcome everybody. So today will be the last Biopsal webinar before the summer break. Then we will have a, a summer break and we will come back in August. So the webinar today is the number 78 and it will be on uh, Jupyter Notebook and uh, Bioconda for Freya and Reproducible via Molecular Simulation Workflow. Our presenter of today is Adam Hospital from the Institute for Research in Biomedicine, Barcelona. I'm Alessandra Villa from the Royal Institute of Technology, Sweden. Am I hosting this uh, webinar for BioXL to go to, together with Otto Anderson from IT Center in Finland? So, the webinar will be recorded for your information, and then we will upload the webinar on the BioXL YouTube channel. And during the webinar, you can ask questions. And to do that, you can use the function, Zoom function that you find at the bottom of the application. Depending on which operating system you have, you can see this symbol of this symbol. Then you just click and you type your question. And it will be nice if you can tell us if you have a microphone or not. And the reason is that because at the end of the, of the webinar, I will unmute you if you have a microphone so you can ask questions directly to Adam. Otherwise, I will read the question in place of you. And you can type your question whenever you want. After the webinar, you if you still have questions, you can go to the Ask by Yourself forum. Here you can see the image of the a picture, a snapshot of the forum. And uh, there is there a category dedicated of bio BB building blocks. And there you can ask questions and Adam will be happy to answer to your question. Something about Adam. So Adam is uh, a postdoctoral fellow at the Molecular Modeling and Bioinformatic, Bioinformatic Unit, uh, RB in Barcelona. And uh, he's also uh, research software engineering for the Spanish National Institute of Bioinformatics. So he has a background in computer science, but he also works a lot in bioinformatics and in biomolecular simulation and together with structural bioinformatics. He has involved in a lot of European projects. He has collaboration with the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and is uh, for a long time member of the BioXL COE. He has developed a, and coordinated a set of uh, public web server and database related to macromolecular structural flexibility, including ENB integrated platform for micromolecular flexibility. And now I'm curious what it will tell us today. So I will stop sharing my screen and give the chance to share to Adam. Thanks, Alessandra. Okay, I hope that you can see my screen now. Perfect. Thanks. You're seeing my pointer too. Okay. So we're good to go. So thanks, Alessandra, for your nice introduction. Um, and welcome all of you to the to the new uh, BioXL webinar. Um, as Alessandra was saying, my name is Adam Hospital. I'm working in the Institute for Research in Biomedicine in Barcelona. And I'm going to present today a collection of uh, fair and reproducible biomolecular simulation workflows uh, that uh, um, using interactive Jupyter notebooks and, and Bioconda packages and, and Conda environments. Um, I, I've divided the presentation in four main parts. Uh, I'll start with an introduction on the Bioxa Center of Excellence, on the workflows, uh, the concept of FAIR, uh, and our Bioxa Building Blocks library. Then I will uh, talk a bit about how we are building our workflows using this library, <clears throat> and in specifically uh, how we are building Jupyter Notebooks with the uniform syntax and how easy they are to install and launch, as you will see. 
then I will try to convince you on how fair our workflows are, or at least I will uh, show you how we are trying to build our workflows following the fair uh, principles. And then I will uh, finish the presentation with a set of uh, brief examples on the collection of uh, Jupyter notebooks that we, that we have implemented. So starting from the beginning, um, uh, as Alessandra was, uh, was mentioning, um, this work that I'm going to present today uh, has been developed in, within the BioXL framework. Uh, BioXL is a center of excellence for computational biomolecular research. We have been there since 2015, so many, many years now. We had three different rounds uh, funded by the European Commission. We started with Horizon 2020, now we are in NeuroHPC. And we have many partners involved in the project, most of them experts in modeling and simulations. Uh, and we had since the beginning uh, a clear objective that was to enable better science in principle by improving the performance and functionality of our mod modeling and simulations key applications, providing support to non-experts and advanced users through uh, training events or webinars like the one that you are uh, that you are now, and developing user-friendly computational workflows. As Alessandra was mentioning, IRB has been leading the development of user-friendly computational workflows since the beginning of BioXL in 2015, and that's exactly why uh, I'm here presenting uh, the result of this work today. So in 2015, as I, I said, uh, I will start from the beginning. We when we started the project, we sit together all the different partners and try to brainstorm about the concept of workflow, about what we uh, thought about the workflow, our ideas about the workflow. And of course, you all know that the workflow is a kind of a pipeline, like the one that you can see in this diagram. You have different processes connected. Uh, some of the processes can have one, can be as simple as one single task. Some of the processes can have multiple tasks, and some of them can be as complex as a, a whole sub workflow by itself. Um, the typical example that I uh, always use is the virtual screening because for our community, it's very easy to understand. Uh, you have on the one hand, uh, a library of compounds. On the other hand, you have a collection of targets. You prepare all the compounds, you prepare all the targets, you run the virtual screening, and you end up having uh, a subset of the compounds, of the candidate compounds. This is a workflow as we uh, define the workflows in our field. But at that moment, when we were together, we uh, also tried to make a list of different methods, tasks, tools that we were uh, using in our everyday work, tools that we were including or methods that we were using in our workflows at that moment. And this is the list is not complete, of course, but you can start realizing that it's really complex. We run modeling, we run MD, QM, hybrid methods, we analyze the trajectories, we run docking, free energy, um, you name it. If you are lucky enough that your research institution or your research group has access to licenses to these uh, fantastic uh, software suites like Schrodinger, Viobia, or Moe, uh, you have almost everything uh, integrated, you're good to go, fantastic. If not, which is... Uh, for most of the uh, scientists I'm sure here, you end up having a myriad of uh, software available. Um, you can see here just examples. There are many, many more. I'm sure that you can have, uh, that you can identify missing software here, but MD software, QM software, uh, chemo informatics, MD analysis, trajectory analysis, um, data analytics, docking processes, many, many different tools that we are using in our everyday work. Uh, and we also analyze how we were using these tools in our workflows, how we were building our workflows. And this is a nice example. This is a real example. This is a shell script. Of course, nowadays, this would be something like a Python script, but the idea is the same. It, it remains exactly the same, which is, let's go to the basics. Line by line, I'm going to write all the command lines here, and I'm going to run all the uh, shell scripts step by step. So I click on run, I run all the workflow uh, as it is. Of course, I'm sure that when you look at this, you can identify that this can have many, many problems associated, especially when you want to um, share this workflow with your colleague, or you want to transfer this workflow to a different machine. 
usability problems of Ray, usability problems, interoperability between tools, portability between machines, reproducibility, scalability. For the sake of time, I'm not going to enter into details on any of these keywords that you have that you can see here, but hopefully you will identify some of them as the ones being in these fair principles that I'm sure that you that you all know. Interoperability, for example, reproducibility, usability and reusability are part of this fair. And actually, when we started all of that, it was 2015, 2016, it was exactly the moment that uh, this amazing um, paper by Mark Wilkinson and colleagues uh, appeared, was published in the Nature Scientific Data uh, Journal. This was a game changer. Uh, this was a, a paper that uh, basically just defined a set of guiding principles for data that were produced by uh, scientific projects. Uh, they claimed that these data produced uh, in these projects should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. That changed everything. So eight years after this, 2024, now FAIR is everywhere. Um, so journals are asking for all data generated by the a particular scientific project or paper to follow these FAIR principles. Even the European Commission are asking for all the projects funded by the Commission to follow these FAIR principles uh, in the data management plan of the project. So everything has changed from this FAIR paper. And of course, as you can imagine, we have tried, many people in the field have also tried to adapt these FAIR principles that were designed in principle for just data. They are trying to adapt these principles for research software. There are many, many different implementations. One of them is FAIR for research software principles, a specification that is now uh, endorsed by the Research Data Alliance. Uh, so many work on that. And as you can imagine, it's not just for research software. There's also people in the field trying to work on making computational workflows fair. So uh, having all of this on the table, having all of this in mind, when we started BioXL, we said, why don't we try to change a bit the mentality, the mentality of uh, our scientists and try to build for the first time our biomolecular workflows following these fair uh, principles applied to research software or workflows in this case. And we took advantage of starting uh, with the Center of Excellence, the Bioxo Center of Excellence. And we also joined forces with the Elixir Life Science Infrastructure, which is a very uh, big uh, European infrastructure that is pushing for best practices in research software and also in workflows development. And that was exactly the beginning of our Bioxo building blocks library. And on top of that, it was the beginning of the collection of workflows that I'm going to present in this, in this webinar today. So what is the Bioxel Building Block Library. The concept is very, very easy. And sorry for the ones that, that uh, uh, attended in previous webinars or training events that we are doing in Bioxel, because this is a repetition, but I'm, uh, I need all of the attendees to be on the same page here. So the Bioxel Building Blocks is basically a collection of Python wrappers. Python wrappers on top of our biomolecular tools, the ones that I presented in the in a previous slide, the myriad of tools that we have available. So we put the tool here, the execution tool here, and what we do is to adapt uh, a uniform uh, uh, set of input files and configuration files. We adapt these input and configuration files to the local input, so the input and properties and parameters that the, the tool understands. We run the tool, and then we do the same. We convert the, the output parameters of the tool to our uniform syntax uh, in, the, in the library. What we achieve with this is something that is very, very important and interesting, which is a high interoperability between the different tools. And we have one of the words on, in the FAIR principles, interoperability. Um, all of these tools are now interoper interoperable between each other. That means that we can easily build workflows joining these tools together. And then we can launch these workflows uh, and control them using different workflow managers, one of them being Jupyter Notebooks and so on. Then we are going to focus uh, in this presentation today. So I've talked about the syntax. Uh, so the, the Python wrappers has a uniform syntax and it's always easy for me uh, to understand that using an example. This is one example. Our syntax is always the same when we are 
running or calling a building block from the library, we need to import a module or a building block. We need to define inputs, outputs, and properties, which are parameters of the tool, and we need to launch a building block. So here, example, there is the edit conf tool from the Gromax MD package, which is the tool that is just building this fantastic box surrounding the molecule. So we um, import the module. We define inputs and outputs as files in your file system and the properties, which are parameters. In this case, I want the box to be cubic and I want one nanometer of distance to the molecule. And then I run, uh, I launch the building block with the inputs, the outputs and the properties. Very easy, I hope. Think about the different example. Now I, I, uh, I'm interested in mutating a residue, a valine to an alanine for this particular uh, protein here. Uh, so I import the module or the building block. I define inputs, outputs, and properties, and I run the, the, the building block. In this case, what is executed, the one that is here in the tool execution layer is modeler. It's a completely different um, tool. And just another one, another example, we can import F pocket um, tool that I'm sure that you are familiar with. We define inputs, outputs, and properties, and we launch the building block, and we find the pockets on the surface of the protein. And now we are using F pocket. So the syntax is exactly the same. This is the library, but we are using, we are calling different biomolecular tools. OK, uh, sorry. Um, I'm sure that you have identified here that uh, we are using different modules, what we call modules. BioVB Gromax is a module. BioVB Model is another module. BioVB Virtual Screening is a different module. These are categories that we um, that we built in our library. Uh, and we have like 17 different categories in the final, in the last release, 2024.1. Uh, categories such as MD simulations with Gromax and Amber, QM, uh, chemoinformatics, free energy, DNA specific, protein flexibility, coarse grain. We have many, many things that allow us to generate uh, the collection of workflows that I'm going to uh, to show you in this presentation. And of course, we are working with many, many others. I'm sure that you will find missing um, tools here. Uh, but if you have suggestions, uh, please send us a message, uh, contact us and uh, take a look at all of these modules and tell us what uh, is missing uh, according to your uh, expertise. Now, this is an important uh, slide. Um, this is a screenshot of the website, of the landing web page. For each of the modules that I presented in the previous slide, we have a GitHub repository for uh, the module. We have read the docs and documentation for the module, and we have Conda, Docker, and Singularity container for the module. This is very important because that means that if I'm interested in one of these building blocks that are included in the BioVB analysis module, the only thing that I need to do to launch this building block uh, is to install, to type this Conda install by UV analysis. And this is going to um, automatically install all the tools uh, that are dependencies of this particular uh, module. That means in this case, in this particular case, Amber Tools and Gromax. If we think another, we, uh, on a, a different case, like the virtual, virtual skinning module, when you type Conda install, it will take the Conda package for this and it will automatically install in your Conda environment, Autodogbin and F pocket. So all the dependencies that the module needs, it's, they are going to be automatically installed. Now, putting both ideas together, the interoperability with a uniform syntax and also this concept of Conda packaging, we can already build the first BioVB workflow in a very easy way. This is an easy workflow. There is basically a ligand parameterization workflow where we are downloading a small molecule using a REST API, adding the hydrogen atoms and minimize the energy of these newly added atoms using OpenBubble in this case, and we generate the parameters with AC pipe. We are building the workflow just uh, joining together the output of this building block with the input of this one, the output of this with the input of this one in a very easy way. Syntax is exactly the same. And then we just built a YAML file, which is the, the file that is telling Conda how to generate the environment that you need to reproduce this workflow, the environment that contains all these tools that are needed for the workflow to run. And this is basically what we did. 
uh, to generate the collection of um, workflows uh, that I'm going to present you today. This is just a screenshot from the website. Please um, um, use a bit of your time after the, the webinar uh, to take a look at all the workflows that are available here in this website. The slides will be made available for you in Zenodo after, after the webinar. Um, these workflows, uh, and this is important too, um, were designed with three main objectives in mind. The first one was to basically to show the power of the library to our users. This is how you can, you can do using the library in a very easy way. The second one is they needed to be transversal. We wanted to, and generic, we wanted these workflows to be really transversal. That means that we can use these workflows in many different scientific projects. And you can think about MD setup is something that you can use in many different projects if you want to run uh, molecular dynamic simulations. Um, and then, <clears throat> sorry about this. Yes. Um, and then the, the other point is that we want to uh, generate these workflows in different, what we call flavors. That means that uh, we start with Jupyter Notebook and then we move to pure Python, common workflow language, Galaxy and Google Colab. And we can, for the sake of time, again, I'm going to concentrate on Jupyter Notebooks today. Uh, but if you are interested in the different uh, flavors, you can just uh, contact me or ask me after the, the webinar. Okay. Now that you know uh, what the BioVV library is, uh, I'm going to uh, spend a bit more time on the workflows, on how we are building these workflows. Uh, and the first slide is to uh, to tell you why we decided to go to choose Jupyter Notebooks and Bioconda for this. Uh, and in general, I think that I'm sure that you agree with me, uh, Jupyter Notebook is a really popular graphical user interface nowadays, mainly thanks to the artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, all, all of these uh, methods uh, have thousands of uh, workflows written in Python and made available uh, using Jupyter no Notebooks. But for me, the important thing, thing is that it's a fantastic tool for training. That means that as you will know, I'm sure, you have different cells. You can run the cells independently one after the other. You can modify the data on the cell. You can rerun the cell. You can inspect the intermediate results. You can integrate these kind of visualizers as you will see in the workflows. So it's a fantastic tool um, for training. And it also has the possibility to run it in my binder. That means that you can automatically deploy your Jupyter notebook in a, in a, a virtual machine on the cloud freely available for you. Uh, I hope that you know about this MyBinder infrastructure. And in particular for the building blocks, it's a very convenient uh, graphical user interface or workflow manager to starting to be familiar with the BioVV syntax. Again, so the, the definition, the importing the, mod the, the module, as you can see here, definition of uh, inputs, outputs, and properties and running, it's the same with every single block. Uh, so it's very easy to be familiarized with this syntax using the, the notebooks. It's also easy to learn how to build the workflows uh, because you're just joining, as I was saying before, joining different building blocks in one Jupyter notebook and then try to package the workflow uh, in generating this uh, environment file for Conda. And this, again, is what we did. Um, but we did it in a way, uh, as you see, we like a lot uh, to the coherence or to be uniform. So we are we have a uniformity in all the different tutorials or demonstration workflows uh, in the collection of workflows. In this case, we always start with a title and a, descri and a description. And I hope that you know about this markdown that you can document your Jupyter Nobus with markdown is fantastic, again, for training and, and um, and it, it, educational purposes is fantastic. Uh, so we start with the title and description. Then we uh, list the BioVV modules used by the workflow and the auxiliary libraries used. And these are basically the list of uh, um, software that we need to add to our Conda environment. So it's fantastic to have it here too. Um, a bit of uh, instructions on how to install and launch uh, the Jupyter Notebook in your own machine, and then the set of steps for the workflow. Again, all the tools will have this uh, header at the beginning. Then for each of the steps that you can see here of the pipeline steps, 
we again have a uniform syntax that is divided in three different parts. The first one is documentation on the cell, on the next cell that is going to be executed. So what is this cell doing? Uh, then we execute the cell uh, with the execution of the building block. And remember that this building block is also, the execution of the building block has also a uniform syntax, importing, defining inputs, outputs, and properties, and launching again. Now I'm sure that you will remember that. Uh, and finally, you have the inspection of the intermediate results. Now, this is a really easy example. It's downloading a PDB from the PDB uh, data bank. Uh, this is the execution of the building block that is actually downloading the PDB from a REST API. And then we are inspecting using NGLB where the file that we have just downloaded. This is a bit more complicated example. This is how to create a system topology using Gromax. And in this case, the documentation is a bit more extensive. And I think that makes sense because you need to say something about which is the force field that we are uh, that we have uh, chosen for this one, which is the water model, uh, what is this uh, building block doing? Is adding hydrogen atoms if it's missing? Is automatically identifying disulfide bridges? Is generating two output files? Again, for educational purposes and for training events, this is fantastic. And also the building block that is used with a link to the documentation of the building block uh, that is giving you all the information that you need about all the compatible properties, compatible inputs and output files, mandatory inputs, uh, etc. This is the execution cell. And this is again the inspection, NGLB, the protein with the hydrogen atoms added after the uh, creating the topology with uh, with Gromax, and this is a Gromax file. But you can also think about uh, intermediate results showing or, or inspecting the intermediate results using, for example, uh, uh, plot libraries like Plotly or Mat Matplotlib, uh, and uh, playing a bit with Python, parsing the files that are generated by the building block, and then um, representing the data with these interactive plots. Final step, once we have the notebook uh, with all the different steps, one after the other with the documentation and the inspection of the intermediate results, we need to generate the YAML file that is the one that is telling Conda the environment that needs to be uh, deployed, generated to reproduce the workflow. Very easy. Let me go back to this slide here. So. We just take this information here with all the modules that we have used in the uh, workflow, the libraries, auxiliary libraries that we have used. We put them together in this Conda environment file. And we put this file and the notebook into a GitHub repository. That's all we need. Because after that, we can directly open this notebook using, again, I was <clears throat> mentioning it before, a MyBinder infrastructure, which is deploying, automatically deploying the Jupyter Notebook on a virtual machine on the cloud for you. And you can start playing with it, or you can go to the Google Colab and use your Google credentials to start uh, playing with the, with the notebook. And of course, you also always have the possibility to download uh, the Jupyter Notebook to your own computer and start working with it. For this, you just need two different software, very easy, Git and Conda. And you just need to type these five very easy command lines. Clone the repository, create the environment in Conda, activate the environment, and launch the Jupyter Notebook. This is everything that you need to reproduce the workflow. You can find links, direct links, to the Jupyter Lab in Binder and to the Google Colab in Google Colab in our website, in our landing page in the in the BioBB website. So now you know about the library, now you know about uh, our uniformity, how we are building our workflows, Jupyter Notebook, Conda Environment to reproduce. Now I'm going to try to convince you about uh, how fair our workflows are. Uh, and I will start with the definition of these fair principles for research software. And I took this uh, paper published in Nature Scientific Data by Michelle Barker and uh, basically, the paper summarizes as the one by Mark Wilkinson for the data principles. In this case, for research software, they summarize that um, research software needs to be uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. And the meaning of findable in this case applied to software is this one. So software and its associated metadata. 
is easy for both human, humans and machines to find. This is important. For accessibility, software and its metadata is retrievable via standardized protocols. For interoperability, software interoperates with other software by exchanging data and or metadata and or through interaction via APIs. And finally, reusable software is both usable, can be executed, and reusable can be understood, modified, built upon, or incorporated into other software. Now, if you look at the logos here, uh, I hope that you immediately realize that most of the things that you can see here, we already have it. So again, we started in 2016 with an idea in mind that was to try to build workflows in a fair way, following the fair principles. So most of these things were already there, but yet there was something that we need to work on, especially the findability of our workflows. So. If we wanted our workflows to be easily find both for humans and machines, we needed to work a bit more on that. And one of the things that if you think about findability of the workflows, OK, you can say, yes, uh, we have everything in the GitHub repositories. But yes, you have millions of GitHub repositories. So it's not easy to find the one that you are interested in. You should go to something like more specific for workflows and in our case for biomolecular workflows. And we were lucky to have something that is called Workflow Hub which is a registry for describing, sharing, and publishing scientific computational workflows. Now, uh, with this, I'm not saying that this is the way to go. This may not be the repository for your workflow, but this is one of the repositories. And everything that, we've, uh, that I will uh, show you about the FAIR principles is, again, the same. I'm not saying that our workflows are, you just need to copy our workflows, our way to build the workflows to make your workflows FAIR, but this is just how we think that uh, we can make our workflows fair. So it's just a proof of concept that the, our workflows can be fair. So we decided to work uh, with Workflow Hub. Workflow Hub is an important portal. It's uh, sponsored by EOSC Life, a very important European project. And it's considered a core resource for the Elixir uh, European infrastructure. Um, so we decided to go and upload all the workflows in Workflow Hub. And what is this giving to us is, generating for each of the workflows a page like this, where you can find in a very easy way metadata about uh, the workflow. Very important, it is assigning a DOI to the workflow. Each of the workflows that we are uploading, they have a new DOI, which can be now used to reference the workflow. It also keeps a version history. If we modify the workflow, you can still find the, the different versions of the of the workflow since the since the day one, you have links to the creators. You have links to many different sites. You have the citation. You have the license here. You can of course download the files that you need. The most important files that you need to reproduce this workflow at uh, and in using your uh, your own computer. We didn't stop here. We also uploaded the the workflows in. Yet another repository or registry, in this case, is BioTools. This is another core resource in Elixir. It's not related to workflows in this case. This is, this is related to services. So <clears throat> here we uploaded all the, um, all the workflows again. And what this uh, is giving, this BioTools is giving, which I think is really nice, is that inputs and outputs are associated with different terms of an ontology that is called EDAM. This is a life science ontology. Uh, and basically with BioTools is uh, giving the possibility to search for, for example, for all the services or workflows that accept as an input a PDB structure and generates as an output a trajectory. So it will give all the services or workflows registered into BioTools that are able to do that, which is really nice. And finally, we worked a lot on our website. So this is a landing page our BioBB landing page, and you will find here lots of buttons, links, information uh, about everything that uh, is uh, going on about the library and also about the workflows. And here you can see all the different flavors in Workflow Hub, how to launch, how to download. And one important thing that is hidden, you cannot see it, but it's by your schemas. And by your schemas is basically uh, a modification of the schema.org markup. And just for you to know, it increases and improves the findability of the web of life science resources. What is this doing is making uh, this 
website, for example, and the information that is included in the website indexable by search engines like Google or Bing. And not surprisingly, including by schemas markup within a web resource is a simple first step to making your data findable. This is why we have the bio schemas here. So we work a lot on the findability. But what about the other ones? As I was telling you before, uh, we hope that all of this was already covered. And actually, it was, at least in our point of view. So for example, accessibility, <clears throat> it says that metadata, software and metadata is retrievable via standardized protocol. We have standard protocols such as HTML to view all the tutorials. So you have a view tutorial button in all the different um, workflows, Jupyter Notebook workflows. We also have, of course, you have already seen that GitHub repositories uh, for all the workflows, and you have a button also on the website. You have also document. We have also documentation using Read the Docs again, another standard in the field uh, for the documentation of uh, software. So all of these is available for you and easy to find through the website. What about interoperability? This is for me fantastic because this was in the heart of the building blocks library. So this wrapper things is basically giving interoperability between the different tools. So we have this uh, at the core of the of the workflows and at the core of the of the library. And this can be exemplified by uh, a workflow as easy as as simple of this one, uh, where we are uh, using different tools. Uh, with exactly the same syntax, exactly the same library. And maybe it's even easier to identify if I show you examples with different flavors uh, other than Jupyter Notebooks, such as Galaxy or Nine. Those are graphical user interfaces, drag and drop uh, workflow managers, where you can just drag and drop one of these boxes. And these boxes are uh, basically building blocks. And then you can um, join one building block with another. The output of one is the input of the other one. And then you can play with the with the parameters, or you can replace one of the boxes. So interoperability is in the heart of the of our workflows. And finally, reusability or usability and reusability. So uh, in this case, I think for me, to me, is one of the most important keywords of the fair uh, uh, principles for research software and also for workflows. And we have worked on two different sides here. One which is really important is reproducibility. You have heard about this word uh, during this presentation a lot. We rely on Conda packages for that. I hope that you know that you're familiar with Conda packages, but basically is um, giving you the possibility to reproduce an environment, a closed environment. There is the environment with all the dependencies needed for your workflow to run in a different computer. Uh, we rely on Conda, but we are also using this Conda to um, generate Docker's containers and singularity containers, all of these can be downloaded. All the workflows can be downloaded uh, with Docker images and Docker files. Um, the other side that we are working a lot is in using and reusing. So how easy is to use and reuse these workflows? And again, I have uh, showed this example many times now. It's really easy to use it because it's really easy to understand once you understand the syntax, the uniform syntax. And it's also very easy, uh, easy to reuse. If you think about, now I'm going to work with a different uh, small molecule. Now I'm going to work with a different, for example, tool to add the hydrogen atoms. I'm not interested in using the open bubble. I'm interested in using the reduce for, for amber, from amber tools. For example, you just replace one block to another in a very easy way. And if you think about use and reuse, there's always one thing that is missing in most of the research software that we, that we can see nowadays, and it's the attribution. And we work also a lot uh, with this, we added extra information in the in the repository, as you can see here. And basically, this information is saying, OK, this is our license. If you want to reuse our workflows, these are the permissions uh, that this license is giving to you. Um, there's also the attribution on uh, the workflow that you have. If you are using this workflow and you want to reference, if you want to cite the workflow, you, we have a citation file format with all the information needed for you to cite the workflow. And also very important, if the workflow is using external tools, which is basically all of our workflows are using external tools, are using uh, Gromax, Amber, uh, Autodoc, Bina, 
all of these tools that I was um, mentioning at the beginning of the presentation, we also have a JSON linked data formatted file with all the information about all the different uh, citations to all the different tools that are used in this workflow. So this is nice, important, and uh, it's not as uh, common to find. OK. Um, I think there are just nine minutes for uh, to to show you a bit of uh, examples. I hope that you that I have convinced you about the the workflows and how fair the workflows uh, that we have developed are. And these are just examples that you can find. Again, I strongly recommend you, uh, please, to take a look at all the collection um, after the webinar. <clears throat> these are just uh, four examples of uh, MD setup workflows. So how to take one structure from the PDB data bank and prepare it to be used to generate a system to be used then to run a molecular dynamic simulation. This is a workflow by itself, many different steps. We have prepared workflows for protein alone, protein with ligand in Gromax, protein alone and protein with ligands in Amber. And basically this, these are, remember this is a uniform syntax for the header. These are all the different steps that are kind of summarized here. Those. All of these images here are screenshots taken from the Jupyter Notebook. So you will see, um, you will be able to inspect the results of the PDB once you have downloaded it, once you have added the water molecules and the box system, uh, after the energy minimization, after the equilibration, after the free unrestrained MD simulation. And as you can see, and this is important, this is 100 picoseconds, and here is 10 picoseconds for the equilibration. Again, these workflows. Um, have been designed with educational purposes. You cannot use these workflows directly in your production uh, just to solve a scientific project because, of course, you will need to uh, increase these 10 picoseconds in the equilibration and also these 100 picoseconds in the MD. But again, this is something to, shower, to show the power of the library. And finally, uh, you will be able to um, to see for the first time a molecular dynamic simulation, short, but a molecular dynamic simulation with these workflows. More examples, a bit different. This one is the protein ligand docking. Again, uniform syntax for the information about the workflow for the pipeline steps. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm, I will just skip this, but basically uh, you're taking the protein, you're taking the ligand, you're trying to dock the ligand uh, with, the, uh, with the target, with the protein target. And those again are screenshots from the workflow. And in this case, I just wanted to show you or highlight that the, the possibilities of the Jupyter Notebooks in this case, we can also include a drop down like this one for you to choose. Imagine that uh, F pocket in this, in this uh, case is giving you two different pockets uh, on the surface of the, is identifying two pockets on the surface of the protein. And the Jupyter Notebook is giving you the possibility to say, okay, which of the pockets is the one that you think uh, is the active site for your ligand to be docked. Uh, and in this case, we can select the number six, and this is generating a box uh, surrounding this pocket. And then you can also select the model, the pose, uh, from the results of the autodoc bina. And you can see here the result of the superposition of the, uh, I, I think is the number zero pose with the experimental result. So again, uh, I encourage you to take a look at the workflows because it's really difficult uh, in a webinar like this to show you the power of the of the workflows. Two very quick uh, examples more. This is protein flexibility, and in this case, we are using coarse grain methods to generate to extract uh, the flexibility, and then principal component analysis to show the uh, the um, the results of this flexibility analysis. Uh, and in this case, I, want, I just want to highlight the power of the markdown. As you can see, these again are screenshots from the from the Jupyter Notebook. And you can see here how you can explain the Brownian dynamics methodology using the formulas with LaTeX. Uh, and this is inside integrated in the, in the notebook. So again, for training um, uh, events and educational purposes, I think the Jupyter Notebooks are really great. And the last one, this is, um, classical molecular interaction potentials. This um, workflow <clears throat> is computing uh, structural water molecules and ions on the energetically most favorable, favorable positions on the surface of the protein. It's also running MIPS, molecular interaction potential, with uh, 
positive, negative, and neutral uh, probes, and is a computing protein ligand and protein protein interaction energies. And these are again uh, screenshots from the workflow where you can see the position of the water molecules and the ions, the probes, uh, positive, negative, and neutral, and the protein ligand and the protein protein interactions that allows you to identify in a very easy way which is the residue of the protein which is giving which is having uh, the best um, interaction energy potential energy with the ligand in this case so again um, I recommend you and I encourage you to take a look <clears throat> at all the collection of uh, of uh, workflows that are available for you uh, in our website and let me please uh, finish with the conclusions um, slide where I just wanted to share with you that uh, I think uh, that science is going towards FAIR now. Uh, and this is clear because research software and workflows should follow the trend that data uh, is uh, following with these FAIR data principles. And I'm sure, and I hope that you have seen that, that new technologies that we have now available are helping a lot on this. Now we have the possibility to work with GitHub, with Conda packages, with containers, with these software registries that are giving us the possibility to make our software findable. And that the collection of IBB workflows is just a proof of concept that we can do that, that this is actually doable. We can take our workflow, we can change our mind, and we can make our workflows a bit more fair, and we can at least work towards making our workflows a bit more fair. If you want more information about the BioXL, the library, or the workflows, you have um, different um, links that you can follow, and you have also a, a paper that we published many years ago about the, the first idea of the BioXL building blocks, and hopefully, very soon in just one or a couple of weeks, because this is just uh, fresh from the oven, you will have the possibility to see uh, and to read our uh, paper published in PLOS Computational Biology, uh, explaining all the results of this uh, collection of workflows. And finally, I just want to acknowledge uh, the team in the IRB Barcelona, Federica, Janice, and Modesto, and uh, the team in Barcelona Supercomputing Center, Pau and Josep Lluís that are working with the BioXL building blocks. And with this, I think that we still have 10 minutes for questions, Alessandra. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. So shall we see, uh, I I can, um, so we will see if Andrea wants to ask his question. I am muted, Andrea. If you can speak, otherwise I will read the question. So maybe Andrea has some problem. So he was speaking about uh, Andal Gromax uh, topology file, and his question is uh, if, if you if the building blocks can uh, change the topology file, act by removing or uh, adding atoms and so on. Okay, so the the short answer is no, <laughs> um, but. So I, I, for me, it's a bit complicated to uh, enter into this. There's different tools that you can use for that. There's Python, the um, GMX API that is working on this. Sorry. Okay. And and then there's a, a new um, a new library that is called Gromologist that is also able to do this. Um, we are in close contact, as you well know, with the Gromax developers. If they think that this <clears throat> is um, you know, it's easy to be done using one of these tools. We will definitely integrate these tools, but it's, now they are not integrated. Uh, the only thing that we have is a particular building block that we needed for the protein ligand complex, that it's basically removing the, uh, the step that you always need to manually do to just uh, modify the topology to include the ITP file of a ligand. There's something that we, also um, discussed with the Gromax developers. I'm sure that this is going to be available directly in Gromax in the near future, but at that moment that was not there and we needed to include it. It's the only building block that is modifying the ITP file, but it's not adding atoms, it's just adding an ITP. 
<clears throat> Thank you very much, Adam. So we have another question from Samuel. Uh, Samuel, I try to, uh, to allow you to speak. Let me, if you can speak, please speak. Otherwise, I will. I will. Can you hear me? Yes, please no. go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, so thanks, uh, Adam, for the presentation. Uh, I would like to know if uh, BioBB models uh, are wrapped from already installed versions system or um, are built with its own third part model versions. Okay. Um, what mm -hmm. I, I want to, to, to say is I, I have to uh, already install these models in my system to work with BioBB, or I I need just to install BioBB and work with its own models. Okay, so as uh, one of the main points for us was reproducibility, what we did is to, as you've seen in the presentation, is to include in each of the conda packages of our modules all the dependencies. So for example, in the BioVB Gromax module of the BioVB library, when you install the package in conda, when you do conda install BioVB Gromax, the Gromax software is automatically installed and is installed from the uh, official conda package. Now, if you already have a, a Gromax software installed in your machine, you still can use this one. You just need to change a property and uh, tell the building block that you want to use the binary that is installed in your machine. So you have the two possibilities. This was um, for us uh, something key if we wanted to use these uh, kind of uh, workflows in supercomputers, for example, where the compilation of these codes, like for example, Gromax are completely different and much more evolved and optimized for the system than the one that you can download from the Conda package. Hope, hope that I have answered you. Yes, thank you very much, Adam. Now we have uh, more, uh, another quest uh, my question from Emeka. I try to allow to speak, shall we see? And it's more on the architecture in the background. So now we see, could you, Emeka, could you try to speak? Hello? Hi, Hello. please Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful uh, right, so lecture for the webinar. Are really very insightful for me. I'm not new to BioExcel workflow. But I've been trying to see if I could use them to analyze some 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 of the projects I have at hand, very computationally intensive projects. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to use them. You know, I was really trying to see if I can manipulate the GPU and the CPU interface for running some computationally intensive module like a Gromax MD run. So it was very difficult for me. So I'm just wondering if it actually puts into consideration these um, background uh, architectures. Now we begin to see different types of GPUs, uh, NVIDIA, Intel GPUs and all that. So I'm wondering, just wondering. Yes. Um, <clears throat> just remember that the library is basically a collection of wrappers. So here the important point about uh, the different architectures is if the software that we are wrapping is compatible with these architectures. And if you think about Gromax, Gromax are making a very nice work on being compatible with all the new GPU cards and all the new architectures, ARM supercomputers, for example. <clears throat> and you can find compilations of this software in these uh, in these architectures. Now, as we are just wrapping this software, is the, if the software is available on these architectures and is optimized by these GPU cards, we can use this because we are using the binary that is installed, we, we can use. So it's just modifying a property of the building block to say again, and it is linked to the previous uh, question, we can tell the, work, the building block to use the binary that is compiled for the particular architecture. Okay, thank you, Adam. And uh, we have a question for an anonymous attendees, so I cannot unmute it. And uh, so the question is related to 
to if there are uh, workflow, MD workflow for DNA and RNA alone, and for protein, 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 DNA, protein, RNA complex. And yes. uh, yeah, it's, so the answer yes, is I, yes. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I, no, was, so, I was uh, reading the, the question. Uh, okay. And uh, yes, we have, for example, an MD setup which is specific for DNA that we are using in in a project that is uh, where we are running more than 300 simulations for DNA and we use this workflow to uh, to <clears throat> set up all the systems we have also protein ligand and we have also protein but but i agree with you different molecules might have different parameters and force fields so again sorry about this but i want to be very clear with that this kind of demonstration workflows that i presented today are designed to be used for educational purposes uh, or just to show the power of the library. Now, that doesn't mean that they work well with all the different systems. You need to know, as you, I completely agree with you, you need to know which kind of forfill is the most convenient for your system. Uh, not just that, but also uh, but if you are uh, working with a ligand with a small molecule, and I can see <clears throat> a different question after this one, you need to estimate the protonation state of the ligand. This is something that is not included in this kind of workflows. These are really, in a way, easy workflows that can be uh, evolved and can be made more, much more complex. But at least it's something to start working on. Uh, it's not something that you can use, again, directly for your scientific projects. OK, did you, did you answer, I think, also the question? I think yes, the other um, question will so answer all the three question that were there. Yeah, yes, just uh, very briefly, the protonation state is something that is not there. Yeah. So, and then there is another question also to, from the same, I think, anonymous attendees, I don't know, free energy and constant pH, but I think somehow you cover it. Which one? Sorry? Uh, I, I We will go there. Now, now I'm mute uh, because we are a little running time. I am mute. Richard uh, uh, has a question, so I allowed him to speak. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Adam. Uh, it's Richard Norman here. Um, just regarding your statement that uh, the reproducibility and the use and reuse of the workflows is straightforward, how much testing have you done to validate this with different users and on different machines? Uh, that's one, one question. And then the second question related to that is uh, what percentage do you estimate of, say, for example, uh, MD simulations that are carried out these days uh, follow fair principles. Uh, and what do you think could or should be done to increase this? This is a nice question. Um, for the first one, I think that we've been validating this for years and years, and you will know that uh, in particular for the different training events, uh, not only for Jupyter Notebook, but also HPC related. We didn't have time to cover HPC workflows in this webinar, but we are also using the BioVB workflows in HPC supercomputers. And in this case, we are using a different workflow manager for that. Um, um, and in this case, we have worked with ARM architectures in Fugaku. We've been working with different file systems. In the training events, we've worked with virtual machines, with what with local computers, any type of computers, M1, Apple M1, M2. And I would say that they are working surprisingly well. Of course, we have find um, problems uh, sometimes, but it, it's, it's, it's for me, it's, it's really working well. This Conda packaging system uh, and how you can reproduce and also reuse uh, and modify. Um, for me, it's working really, really well. Ag again, it's not working, it's not universal, it's not working everywhere, but it's working really well. Uh, and, and I think that all of this, we need to thank it to, to a new technology. So the packaging, the containerization and all this um, new technology. And about the second one, second question is a really nice question. I think that uh, the percentage is, uh, uh, I don't want to say ridiculous, but uh, we are not uh, working with fair principles, at least, when you think about preparing the systems or running the systems, there's no provenance. I didn't talk about provenance uh, today in this talk, but there's no provenance associated. There's little metadata associated to the 
to the simulation or to the setup system. And this is something that uh, the field is starting to realize now, and we are all starting to work on that, but it's still a way to go. Thank okay. you, Adam. Thank you very much. So I will, uh, it's Fabrice is the last question. And then I will ask uh, Han and Juan to ask their question on the forum. So uh, Fabrice, I try to unmute you. Uh, let us know if you can. Uh, yeah, can sure. I, I Please don't know. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Adam, for the presentation. So yeah, my question was about the of course, you you end your presentation saying that it was a proof of concept. So I understand that it's a, a subset of selected tools. But I was wondering how you got the, the workflows and why it was restricted to some tools. Because at the beginning of the presentation, you, you propose a large number of tools that would be potentially available in the workflows. So, uh, and my question was related about also the contribution, what, who are the contributors and whether uh, some uh, uh, some colleagues could contribute to the workflows uh, and and make them available on your uh, on the BioExcel website. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Fabrice. This is a nice question too. Um, <clears throat> so actually we, we have integrated many of the Sim or by molecular simulation tools that I presented in this slide, although some of them are, are kind of hidden uh, in the modules. So if you see BioBB analysis, <clears throat> um, BioBB analysis maybe is not a great example because it's Gromax and Amber tools, but BioBB chemistry, for example, we have there, I think this is AC pipe, open bubble, Amber tools, there's many. Um, so they are in a, in, a, in a way hidden there. There's a, a reason why we concentrated on MD and actually, we didn't concentrate just on MD. We, we focused on Gromax, Haddock, PMX, and CPMD, CP2K for quantum mechanics that were at that moment when we started the library were the key applications in BioExcel in the center of excellence. So just as a proof of concept, again, that the library was doable and it was working really well, we started with the integration of all these tools, which were the key applications in BioExcel. From these tools, we started to integrate more and more tools. And basically we work, and, and now that the third round of BioExcel is working in a kind of a user-driven way. So if users are asking us, are giving us some feedback about it, it would be really great to have this tool integrated in BioBB. We add this in our plans and we see if we can prioritize this. Um, so this is the way. About contributions, this is really nice. Um, I, It's not, you are not the first one asking us about the possibility to contribute workflows. We have always thought about the contributions of the open source code. We Everything that we developed in the library is open source. So you have everything in GitHub. You are really open and free to go and uh, run or launch a pull request with modifications, with additions. It's OK, but it's true that we don't have any way for our users to contribute workflows. Um, and this is something that we need to we need to think about. So thanks for the for the suggestion. Okay. Thank you very much, Adam. It was a great presentation. I thank you all the attendees for attending and for the nice discussion and for the question. So please go to askbyexcel.eu to ask more questions to Adam. He will be very happy to answer via the forum. And uh, and then I want, as Adam was mentioned, by Excel soon is will come out with a surveys for all the core application so between June and September. So you are welcome to give your feedback. And uh, we will start again at the end of August, begin September, probably with uh, with different webinar. And the one will be on PDBE, one of the first webinar, and then we will have also a webinar on the story about Gromax on the Lumi architecture and then more other webinars. So I wish you a nice summer, even if it's still early and then see you back in September. Thank you very much. Bye.